Good afternoon and welcome to another session of Decision Making Voices from the Field. My name is Alp Attic and I'm an MPH candidate in the Department of Health Policy and Management at the Harvard School of Public Health. It is with great honour that I introduce this afternoon's guest, Mr Ashok Alexander. Ashok led the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation's India office from its inception in 2003 until 2012. Over the decade, Ashok led the growth and expansion of the Gates Foundation's first country office, with grants spanning health, sanitation and agriculture. The portfolio of grants that he oversaw amounted to over $1 billion across India, involving scores of grantee organisations. It was while in India that he created Avahan, the Gates Foundation's flagship India AIDS prevention program. In three years, Avahan rolled out community-led AIDS prevention in more than 600 towns in the six states and across the national highway system. Avahan became the largest private prevention program ever undertaken in HIV AIDS and is considered today a global model of scaling up health delivery. Ashok's team then took the business model behind Avahan to new public health interventions, such as maternal and child health and infectious diseases in Bihar, India's poorest state, and Uttar Pradesh, India's largest state and also one of the most underdeveloped. Ashok has 24 years of experience in the private sector, working in Hong Kong, the United States and India. Prior to joining the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, he was a director in McKinsey and & Company and head of the consulting firm's New Delhi office. Ashok is a graduate of St. Stephen's College in New Delhi and has a postgraduate degree from the Delhi School of Economics and an MBA from the Indian Institute of Management in Ahmedabad. Ashok's current project is in developing Antara, a non-profit organization dedicated to health delivery at scale. We thank you Ashok for joining us today and for sharing your insight from the vast and diverse experiences you have had in public health. Before I turn the seminar over to Dr. Berman, please join me in welcoming our guest, Mr. Ashok Alexander. Okay, thanks very much, Alp. That's a great introduction. And Ashok, it's great to have you here. Um, a personal pleasure for me to welcome you and to have you here at the school. Uh, we've known each other since about 2004 when I went to India as the lead economist for the World Bank's Health Nutrition Population Program. I remember one of our first meetings. Uh, and uh, I came to see you, and uh, we were talking about World Bank projects, and I was telling you that uh, typically a World Bank health project in India was something on the order of 150 to 200 million dollars for a pro each project and you looked at me with astonishment and you said how can you possibly think about spending that amount of money wisely mm -hmm. um, and I'm glad to know that the Gates Foundation projects now total up to more than a billion dollars <laughs> uh, so India has a way of growing uh, things growing uh, to outsized proportions uh, and uh, I hope you're going to tell us a little bit about how you were able to, um, to find the way to do that. Um, thanks to Alp's introduction, we heard a lot about your background uh, in consulting with McKinsey. Um, and I think it's just uh, interesting for us to take a moment to reflect that in global health recently, there's been an increasing role played by uh, consultants and consulting firms that come from the business side. Um, of course, the last few years have reminded us that not all the advice that consulting firms have given, uh, even on the business side, has always been the best. So this conversation today, I think, is a great opportunity for us to uh, look a little bit behind the curtain about what you found that worked well from your business experience and maybe some of the things that uh, may not have worked as well. And we'd like you to share both positive and not so positive experiences with us. So let me start off with uh, a first question. Uh, 24 years in the private sector, McKinsey, the capitals of global business, suddenly in 2003, your own choice, but you're dropped into a different world, HIV AIDS in India. You're dealing with governments, one of the world's largest and, you know, one could argue one of the more difficult uh, governments. Um, you're dealing with non-governmental organizations, international and domestic, many of whom were antithetical to the business community, critics of the business community, with high-risk groups, people living with HIV AIDS, uh, groups you rarely encountered, I would guess, in the boardrooms in New York and Hong Kong. So from this experience that you had in the private sector into this new world, where did you find common ground, uh, common language, common thinking, 
that helped you work with this new community? And where did you find that there was little common ground from your past experience where you really needed to learn a new language and a new way of thinking? That's a great question to start with, Peter. If I put one word to it, I would say I found the switch from the private sector in McKinsey to the world of public health devastating. Uh, <laughs> because, you know, I came into this, uh, you know, thinking I was kind of a wise guy. I was at a world's leading consulting firm. I thought I knew how to solve problems. And I thought public health would be an extrapolation of that. And as, as soon as I started going out in the field, I found firstly that there was an India that I ne never knew. An India that I'd been explaining to people was a very different India, even geographically, very distant places, uh, places I'd never been, uh, different settings, brothels, places where sex work, transgenders work, different populations, all of that. But I think most importantly, I was seeing a kind of grinding poverty that I'd never seen in almost 50 years of living in India. And it was it's the kind of poverty that forced a woman to sell herself for 50 rupees in a transaction. And I understood that was the devastating portion, that everything I'd learned about problem solving, uh, some of it was completely irrelevant. Yet, I think there were issues, there were techniques uh, of focus, of issue analysis, which one could apply. But the other thing you alluded to, the world of NGOs and so on, that again took some getting used to because there was a different culture and a different way of work. You're probably using the very same methods that you learn in public health and you sort of learn them in business. They aren't very different, but the culture and context are very different. Finally, I'd also just say this, that what I found particularly devastating was the notions I had of public health. So I've said this somewhere that, you know, I sat on the floor of a mud hut and asked a sex worker, why don't you use condoms? You'll die if you don't use condoms. You have to practice safe sex. We're working in HIV prevention. And she said, why don't you tell me something that I don't know? And I, when I asked her what she wanted, she wanted a life free from violence. And I couldn't see the connection, right? Or when I saw people and found that you could you were moved enough to say, let me give 500 rupees to this kid because he's going to die. And someone reminded me that I was in public health, right? So there are thousands of people. All said and done, it was initially devastating. And I wondered to myself, what have I gotten into? And McKinsey was a nice, comfortable place. Mm -hmm. But I'm glad, you know, that devastation, and I think this may happen to people who go into the field in public health, went to a feeling of, inspiration, even elation, and uh, you know, luckily it went on from that. Let me push you a little bit on that. I think you've given us some very good examples on the places where you really had to reach into new understanding and knowledge of yourself. But could you help us with some examples of where you actually had common ground with the people you were working with, where they said, ah, he can bring something that I find is useful, or you thought you had something useful to bring, and maybe some examples of that. Yeah, when we talk of people, though, therefore I'd like to concentrate most on frontline people. Mm -hmm. I mean, I could talk about NGOs and governments, and I think those are important, we should talk about that. But what did I find in common with the sex worker uh, or the injection drug user? And I think one of the common and most important things was understanding demand, right? I think a lot of public health programs, I think kind of, throw condoms or they throw uh, needles for exchange and so on at populations without understanding what do they really need. Mm -hmm. So I think there was a common ground because in business you do that. The old thing of understand what the consumer really wants and how relevant your product is became a very meaningful application for me. And when the community said, okay, he's understanding that I want a life free from violence, he's getting that. It was because I saw a connection from violence to HIV, safe sex, and so on and so forth. So I think there was a point of connection. I'd also say this, you know, I, I think Avahan, and I'm tempted to say public health, is not about just averting infections. Uh, there's a kind of social capital, if you will, that you build, better lives, empowerment, and things which you can't put in a PowerPoint slide. And when people saw that you are as engaged with that and they were part of their life, I think that was important uh, common ground. 
That's great. I know what that answer is. No, I think that's great. And I think this point of demand is, uh, I think public health people are often yeah. very good at, th at thinking about need and response to yeah. need. I but mean, I can answer the same question, common ground with government or common ground with NGOs, but you don't want me to hold uh, No, I don't mind. You want to give us another example? Long, and you'll probably get bored in any case. So, <laughs> Give us one example of common ground with uh, government or NGOs where you're... Uh... Well, I think working with NGOs with government, I could talk a lot about that, but the government system in India is like monolithic. And you have to look for leadership within that system. Otherwise, you can't really work with that. When you find people, like Sujata Rao and a few others, then you have common ground immediately. And the common ground is because you, you are concerned about the mission, which is really working with frontline people and trying to improve their health. So that common ground was easy, but you have to search. It's not easy if you say you're dealing with government, and I say this with the greatest respect to the government of uh, to the government of India. With NGOs, surprisingly, uh, surprisingly, I found it difficult to find common ground initially, mm. because you thought that would be easy, right? I mean, you're working towards a common goal, but the cultural difference was so vast that the same things that you'd learned as an MBA or in, in public health, but when you went out into the field and the application of it, it seemed very different. For example, I think a lot of our NGO partners thought that we were too rough and ready. We were probably crude in our methods. Uh, you need to test something and pilot and prove that the solution is right. And we thought that was a waste of time because people were dying. Uh, so the speed notion uh, came to it. The perfection notion came. And I think the common ground was a struggle to find. And it's not a question of finding one leader in an NGO. You really had to. Uh, it may sound uh, wrong, but sometimes you have to impose mm. what you felt was the right way of doing it. At some stage, you can't negotiate the stuff and let's have a co uh, you know, consensus on how we save lives. You have to believe in what you think is the right way. And you can say, let's do this together, or let's just find people we can do it with. Great. That's uh, actually a great segue into the next question I had for you. So let me see if we can move that uh, move in that direction. So in your um, in your uh, teaching and writing about these things, uh, you've talked about a cycle which you've described as design, organize, execute, and sustain. Right. And typically, we think of you know the um, uh, the um, high level. Uh, consulting coming in and primarily focusing on the design. This is what uh, I think often McKinsey is asked to do, help with the design. And Avahan was led by a team, led by you, but led by a team of others with this kind of business experience. But most of the implementation was done by both international NGOs and Indian NGO NGOs who came much more from that public health world, that public health background. Um, so. How much did you find, and in what ways did you find, that you needed to work with these NGOs, both the international and domestic, and I'd like to contrast those two, if that makes sense, um, to change the way they worked? Um, because they really had to be uh, both motivated and also execute what was being designed. And where were you able to, as a leader of that program, bring in your your thinking to work with them? You're talking about the execution portion specifically? Both motivating them and execution. Yeah. Well, I was just alluding to the cultural difference right. and the importance of motivation or the importance to say, okay, let's, in a, some sense, decide that we can't motivate each other enough. I think that was, that was the biggest challenge. And the second was the, the sort of more technical or the conceptual idea of scaling up. So I found that there was a lot of a focus on sort of perfecting a model and having this kind of hope model that once you got something perfected, somebody else would come and take that away and scale it up. Mm. And it wasn't very clear that anybody would or that the public health system would. So one had to sort of get away from that approach to scale and take scale itself and piece part and look at it as a technology in and of, in and of itself. But then it was a partnership. <clears throat> the NGOs, domestic and international, had things that we never had. Many of the domestic, especially the grassroots NGOs, had the connect with the community already and the trust. The international NGOs had a kind of 
technical knowledge, because you can't just do this with hand waving and business skills alone, that they bought in. Mm -hmm. you know, how do you manage STIs? How do you run a clinic well? How do you monitor and evaluate? So it became a real partnership. So I'm emphasizing again that the beginning of the partnership and the cultural context is very different. I'd like to, th I can certainly say how much I learned. It's, I go on about that from our partners. I hope they'll say they learned something from us. So that's how it went. It was not without its tensions, its pushes and pulls and its unpleasant sides, but there was also a lot of fun mm -hmm. and a lot of mutual respect. So do you see uh, do you see a process where, in particular, coming back to the uh, national and local NGOs, um, I, I like your framing of this uh, as a hope model. You know, we've done it, now someone else should pick it up and, and scale it up. Um, is there, has there been learning that you can point to where uh, national and local NGOs have been able to fill that gap more and are moving more towards the scale up and sustainability side? Yeah, definitely. I think a little bit of my disappointment is in the domestic, so the question is two parts mm -hmm. to it. I think if I pick one international group, which is not an NGO, is a university, actually the University of Manitoba, were working in a small part of Karnataka, mm -hmm. two districts, and then they started working in all of Karnataka. Now they're leading the application of those lessons in uh, two or three countries in Africa. And I think that university has become massive yeah, as an NGO, yeah. if you will. And there are others who've done that. What I'm disappointed about is that, you know, when we start working with domestic NGOs, I think it's Unfortunate that in a country you, you don't have domestic NGOs which have the scale and the wherewithal to take up what international NGOs mm -hmm. did. And I felt that after five years, we would have three or four or five Indian NGOs that would do that. That's not really happened uh, for various reasons. I think that there could be many reasons to it, but many of them probably feel that, hey, a state in India is pretty big, and mm -hmm. you don't have to think about Africa or something like that. So I'm not disparaging them in any way, but just something that I maybe naively expected didn't happen. But this is a challenge for the future in India, I It think. is a challenge. How long? And I don't think it's appropriate. I'm sure the international NGOs would say that, that you have to fly in someone from the U.S. or Europe or wherever to say, help solve India's problems because you guys are used to working at scale. Right. In fact, I don't think they're that used to working at scale either but probably they were coming in new and they were more open to working in a, in a different way. Yeah. Uh, many of us who've uh, worked in India have noticed that there, you know, there is a very vibrant non-governmental sector in the country, but it is, there aren't very many examples of large-scale yeah. uh, organizations. So maybe this is a new challenge for you. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I <laughs> asked up. a head of an NGO that provides excellent treatment to orphans affected by HIV. And so I said, this is wonderful. Now, how do we have 1,000 such? And she looked at me, and she was very angry. Mm. She said, this is not my job. Mm. I'm having a tough enough time running one of these. And she was outraged that I asked the question. Right. So it's different. Good. Yeah. We'll pose that one for our students to think about. Uh, we should have some questions. Post-study, post-study. Post yeah, we'll come to them. Um, I've got one more for you. Uh, and, uh, and let's see if we can then engage the audience a little more in this conversation. So, um, you know, as you've described it, Avahan uh, is, uh, uh, is known as uh, using what's called a BOT model, a build, operate, transfer model, which is a model that's been very widely used in public-private partnerships, widely used in India to many positive results. Anyone who has recently arrived <coughs> at Delhi's international airport has experienced the benefits of the BOT model with, uh, in a very short order, less than a year, a beautiful new international airport constructed, which is well run, clean, efficient. Um, and, you know, that's the BO stage. Very nice, exciting. But then there's the T, transfer. Um, so Avahan is now well advanced in this process of transferring. Uh, its successful model to government ownership and government operation and hoping for the sustainability of the lessons that have been learned. I'd like to pose the question to you generally, can government meet this kind of challenge? Can a government in a place like India meet this kind of challenge given its rules and procedures? And more specifically, I'd like to ask you, 
One leader to another, when you're sitting there with the new director of the National AIDS Control Organization, uh, what would be your key advice to them uh, to make successful this transfer phase? You know what I'd like to do, Peter, if, if you allow me, is to turn that question over to maybe any of the students in this audience. Okay. Let, uh, let's, you know, maybe get their view on that, and then I'll take a cut at it. Who'd like to take a crack at that question? Your key piece of advice to the director of the governmental AIDS control program acquiring the responsibility to uh, take over and sustain this successful non-governmental initiative. What should they do? Shalu, I've never known you to be without something <laughs> to say. <laughs> well, I had a question for a show before I could think about no, it. No, you have to answer this question. And then you and, might get and another then you chance. Can ask all the and questions. And please wait for the microphone to come. It's called putting people on the spot. Um, I'm Shalu. I'm a, a mid-career break to do an MPH here. Um, and I knew Ashok, actually, I met him in 2004 as well, when I had just started my job with the World Economic Forum. And um, uh, just before I get on to that question, one of the things I really learned from you <laughs> was your uh, humility. And why, when I moved from WHO to the Forum, everybody said, oh, so now you're going to in this big organization, so you're become, going to become all this snobbish kind of a person and I came across people like Ashok and I realized that I don't have to be one of those arrogant snobs. I could be a humble person like him and still continue to do good work mm -hmm. and also have some authority on certain things. But coming back to that, I mean that's a very difficult question. I wonder how you um, even had any sort of conversations about them taking over. So that was my question, which we'll so come to later. You are throwing the question back at yeah, me. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm like really curious. I mean, how did you actually convince them to I, actually take responsibility? I uh, okay, that's a fair thing to do. I want to just see if there are anyone else in the audience who'd like to just offer their thoughts. What I'm would not be, such a humble guy. <laughs> <laughs> what would be your advice to the head of the government program taking over this? non-governmental activity. Anyone? Okay, well, take a crack at oh, okay. <laughs> Seems to be a hard question, so we'll have to hear what tough. Ashok has yeah, to say. We'll have to give it back to you, but... Um, and with government, people don't get Could you stand up, Shalom? Oh, I think sure. we'd like to... Yeah. <laughs> we'd like to... You've got to be very quick with government people. So, yes, yeah. exactly. So uh, I would probably ask them to continue working with the private sector, but also the NGOs. I know you mentioned something about the capacity of NGOs, and I can foresee some of the reasons for why NGOs cannot scale up. Uh, perhaps that's what the government needs to do, because alone they cannot do it. Uh, even if they take on Navahan, they will continue to, they will need to work with the private sector as well as the NGOs. Okay, Ashok, so I guess know, it's fallen I to you. I think answered part of the question. I think if you think of transitioning stuff to the government and you break it up into pieces, it's, it's like a pyramid. There, there are operating procedures which you can put into manuals. There are things that you can transfer very systematically and maybe they amount for a large part of the transfer. But there's an aspect that boils down to leadership, especially of communities. You can call it the fire in the belly. You know, the sheer uh, uh, passion to get something done, uh, absolutely, to get it done. You can't put, translate that into something you transfer easily. Mm -hmm. So what I would say to the head of that thing is that be very wise and understand what we're trying to transfer. It's not a set of manuals and procedures and an MIS. You're really trying to transfer leadership of frontline groups who've gotten used to working in a certain way. And if you overlook that and you gloss over that, then you will not get the real value of what you're doing and you will actually a lot of things will fall apart mm -hmm. that we built so far. And I'm concerned about that. I still don't know the answer. I mean, I don't want to throw too many questions at the audience, but someone has to think about this. How do you really transfer fire in the belly mm -hmm. from a private system to a public system? So what could a leader of an organiz a governmental organization do uh, to take your advice? Well, first he or she has to go and engage herself in the field for a long time. And if you're with government, unfortunately, you're dealing with so many things that you don't have the time to do that. That's one of the, the simplest things you have to do. You have to engage because then you can feel certain things, but you can also get insight into a lot of solutions mm -hmm. uh, that you have to do. 
I think that's first and foremost what you have to do. Then you have to have the ability to listen. And then most importantly, you have the ability to take your insights and see them through a government system, which is monolithic and often tells you why things can't be done. So you need a great leader in the government system to do that. Very savvy person. Mm -hmm. A very open person. And that, that is something that may or may not happen, given the system of appointments and... Uh... It, let's say, often does not happen. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it happens, and as I said in the beginning, you have to be able to search out those people. Right. I wonder if we're going to find some of the same problems in transferability with the Delhi airport also. <laughs> <laughs> Fortunately, yeah. we have 20 years to wait until that happens. Um, Let's take a moment to give the audience a chance to pose some other questions <coughs> to Ashok. Uh, is there anyone who'd like to, to step up and, uh, uh, and ask him a question about his experience or ideas? There must be some burning question appearing. Please. Could you introduce yourself? And Ready? please stand up also. My name is Ranu Dillon. I'm a hospitalist at Brigham and Women's Hospital, and I work in the Division of Global Health Equity at the medical school. My question, I have two components to a question. Um, there are obviously many complexities towards making particularly public service delivery programs like health work in the public sector, in India especially. Two of the bigger challenges that I've come across in work I've been involved with is at the level of when you get below the state level, the administrative capacity and the bandwidth to be able to take complex interventions and systems and actually put the nuts and bolts together on the ground level. Um, and secondly, the demand from the community level that's needed to, in some sense, urge that on. And I feel like those are two parts of a, of a cycle that if you're able to get it to work, as it does in Tamil Nadu to some extent and some other places, you can really see effective service delivery take hold. And I wanted to get your perspective based on your work, how you, can, how you see entering, how to, how to enter into that cycle. How do you get it initiated? And what are the challenges in India that need to be overcome in particular to try to initiate that kind of a virtuous cycle? Yeah. Uh, it's such a terrific question. So there are two parts to it. The first part is how do you get the governmental or public system at the district level to, to work, really? That's it. And again, it's a, it can look like a staggering problem because that's a national problem taken to a district which is very large. It's a few million people. How do you do that? Uh, what I found the most useful way of doing that is to take that right down to the frontline level and say who are the government health workers who have to then deal with the population, with the consumer. And in India there are three. There's the ASHA, someone called the ASHA worker, there's the Anganwadi worker and the auxiliary nurse midwife. And then you have to ask a simple question. Think of that as almost a sales force. What does the sales force have need in terms of support? For example, uh, the ASHA worker needs to under us understand a simple denominator. How many pregnant and lactating women are there in this village? What can you do to help uh, with that? Are there handheld technologies? Are there, can you simplify the record keeping that she does and so on? If you put it that way, it, you can simplify the problem to say that you don't actually need 10,000 things. You don't even need the district collector need four or five things. And you can start working on that and it actually becomes quite powerful. You can talk about how do these three uh, women collaborate together, where they come from separate ministries and so on. It's, you can spend a lot of time on this, but you have to go to the district collector who sets about it all. And you have to search for leadership. But again, I come back to the second part of your question. To me, the demand side is even more important much more important because it's usually neglected. We think that these are, these are what we say, people who are recipients always, who cannot demand. And so you have to sort of work with them in such a way that they, they uh, come together on issues that impinge on health but also get them a seat at the table. They must, communities must have a seat at the table by which they demand health as their constitutional right. And you know, guess what? The system quickly falls into place. The, the district collector, the politician start seeing votes that are being lost otherwise. The police see that they're not doing their job. We have a democratic system in India that helps, right? Community mobilization, I believe, at least in India, is the most neglected, biggest lever that you can use in public health. 
and it's right there and it's just it's a good thing to do at the same right uh, same way um, good interesting answer uh, would someone else like to come in question or comment I'm a very persistent host here if someone's going to have to step forward would you like to would yeah, sure. Okay. Sorry, Shalu, but we got to give someone else a chance. Um, hi, my name's Katie. I'm in the two-year uh, health policy and management program here. And you've talked a lot about scaling up. Um, and one of the concerns with scaling up from health is that health still needs to be seen at a local level. So can you give a couple of examples of specific criteria that still allows you to successfully scale up while keeping health at the local level? Well, I'm not quite sure I understand the question. When you say health needs to be kept at the local level or health is a local issue? The, is that the issues even within a state, as in India, um, right. will vary from state to state. Right. And the importance of making sure you're customizing to that p particular state. Right. So I think, th okay, thank you, and Anna. Maybe also, is, is, there an, is there a conflict between localizing and scaling up? Are these two things somehow, uh, if I can? Yes and no. I think that if you, if you try to put it very simply, there are th certain things that can be standardized, both in terms of your approach and both in terms of the phenomenon of the, of the problem. I mean, let, let you, let's just take uh, STI management. There are some places where you know you can treat syphilis a certain way, and it is prevalent in certain types of areas and populations. You can standardize the treatment of that with penicillin or, or so on and so forth, and you scale that up. If you want to roughly call it a, a cookie cutter type of approach, with a, and that's good. So the first step is understanding what can be standardized in the health condition, which is not local, which can be universalized. There are other aspects which are very, very uh, contextual to the geography, to the culture, the customs, and so on and so forth, which often involve behaviors, specific behaviors. I think there's no other solution by having, except having perhaps that triumvirate of people we talked about or the frontline workers who are peers who have the flexibility and the freedom to adapt and tailor a solution. So for example, in our program, we were working on HIV uh, management, prevention, our sales force, if you will, were peer workers who spent half their time on sex work, half the time in prevention activity. So there were parts we could standardize, like the STI management. But there were other aspects which couldn't be standardized. Uh, the type of transactions, women, sexual transactions that happened, whether it was a home-based or a brothel-based kind of situation, um, the number of partners, the religious aspect, the caste aspect, so that peer worker had to understand the 50 sex workers that she looked after and be able to do micro-plan and say, I'll, these are five or six women of a certain category, these are seven or eight of another category, and therefore bring that excellent tailored solution there. What you're standardizing is an approach all over. You're giving that flexibility. Now, how do you make the whole thing work towards scale? Because you could have 10,000 flowers blooming, and that's no point. So the trick, I think, in the whole system is to enable rapid data transfer all over the system. Now, how do you do that? Actually, this, you can take, we used to have Skype conversations from here to there, and, and there are many ways of doing it. It's actually not so complicated. So conceptually, if I answer your question, there are things that can be used cookie cutter, very, very important. There are things that need localized solutions, and you should let 1,000 flowers bloom but you must have rapid data transfer all around. You can't afford to pilot and roll. See, this is the thing. People say it's so local, we have to pilot it, roll it out, roll it out. You cannot do that because it's exactly the reason you said the local contexts are so different. What are you going to roll to? You know what I'm, I wonder whether I'm being clear mm -hmm. in this. You're being clear. Right? Yeah. I hope I've answered you. No, I think that's great. I think, you know, just to kind of, uh, some good takeaways from that are, there are, and it's knowing which are which, but there are things right. to standardize. Right. There are things where flexibility and adaptation is important. Knowing which is which, that's, yeah. I think, a real challenge mm -hmm. for public programs in particular, which tend to over-standardize. And then that communication, that flexible communication. Yeah. That's Peter, great. I'd like to just say a word here, because, you know, 
we make a lot out of this business model. I've made a lot out of the business model, but we, we exaggerate it because what we do in public health actually goes way beyond business. No business would run itself like this. The shareholder would say this is highly risky. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm going to sell that stock very fast. So, and then you're using techniques like, I haven't heard of businesses who actually empower the consumer so much as to say you got a lousy product. You know, so, and so on and so forth. So I don't want to say business is the, it goes so far, but it's, yeah. Great. Uh, let's take one more, great. Hi, my name is Ankita. I'm an MPH candidate. I did my medical school in Mumbai. And when I was working there, I worked with an NGO called Prasad Chikitsa that works with HIV. And something I've seen commonly there is there's a lot of suspicion between NGO and like the government outposts. And in such a scenario, how do you facilitate like cooperation or how do you get them to work together? You mean with the government with system? The, with the NGO and like we worked at like the primary care center and there was also an NGO that did its HIV work in the same area. But there's a lot of suspicion and you know, a lot of times they don't want to send their patients over to the NGO. The NGO doesn't want to send their patients back to the primary health care center. So how do you get them to talk? Well, it's not an easy thing to do because that's these are systems that are kind of set in their way. On the one hand, you may have a government worker who's just really tired and overworked and doesn't have time to fully understand the consumer. And you have a consumer who's deeply skeptical and distrustful. In our method, uh, what we had to do was to demonstrate a model of a different way of working. And then to find the leadership within government that says, okay, we understand that that's a different way of working. And I'm not talking culturally alone. I'm talking about the, the management information and so on and so forth that goes into it. And then be able to transfer that. Uh, that's the only way. Uh, I don't know that of anything, but that's a diligent way of doing it. It takes a f some effort and years of, of work to do this. I don't think there's any shortcut uh, to doing that. Please. And Shalo, I'm going to give you one last bite at the apple, briefly, though. <laughs> Hello. My name is um, Tokwe Olukowi. Um, I'm an MPH student in global health, um, trained as a physician. I've done a couple of um, projects with HIV and PMTCT back home in Nigeria. And here's my question. When it comes to scale up, how do you transition your project from international aid um, cultural thinking about it and transition it to the go, um, country ownership because you find out a lot of the times the countries are usually very skeptical and reluctant to take up the responsibility of owning the program mostly because of the financial implications so is there any systematic or um, should I say innovative way to ensure that countries step up to the ball and take ownership of these programs and in a financially sustainable way you know, the financial aspect of it uh, is very country specific. So in India, you find a lot of spending is private spending from the consumer directly to a private provider who's often not fully, fully qualified. Donor spending is less than 1%. So where the World Bank and others, many countries depend on that, it's extremely small, the Gates Foundations and so on and so forth. So really, the adoption within into the budget, the government budget's actually quite substantial. It's really a question of getting the government not to fund something that because funds are short. The funds are being not used optimally. So you have to demonstrate a model and government will quickly say, you know, we'll, we'll use our funds for that. So the, what I'm trying to say is that the financial aspect is not that complicated in a country like India. Enlightened state governments are saying, teach us how to spend the money better. But it goes back to the second part. You have to see, get, get government by looking for leadership in government to appreciate that there's a model here that can serve our purpose of scaled healthcare provision. And so therefore you have to create the model and therefore you have to have, find the leadership to do that. And at least in India you don't have to worry about the money portion of it, oddly enough. The little bit I know about certain countries in Africa and so on, that is also a big issue because government budgets may be inadequate. I don't know fully know the answer to that. Shalu, please. Thank you very much for the second. Could you stand? Oh, yes. Sir. Thank you. So, Ashok, um, 
do you think it would have been any different if it wasn't HIV you were dealing with, uh, considering the sexiness of the disease? And uh, second thing, uh, some of the positive uh, lessons that could be transferred to uh, other disease areas, if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, well, thanks, Shalu, for asking me that question. I really wanted to find a way to talk about that. Because it's easy to look at HIV and sex work and say, okay, this is very good. This is a kind of exotic and strange situation. The real, I really believe that the lessons that we learn from HIV prevention taken to scale are universal and portable. So they are as relevant in maternal and child health or in the control of tuberculosis. And they're actually relevant in scaling out treatment. So. Because what are these universal lessons? We're talking about community mobilization. We're talking about the use of data uh, and so on. These are, these are very universal. And I'm not just talking conceptually. Uh, I was able to lead a team that introduced the very same method into maternal and child health in Bihar. And who's starting to do that in UP, which are very different challenges. So superficially, I think this is a learning for me. You can look at the health condition and say this is very specific. Sex workers, concentrated epidemic, highly stigmatized, maternal and child health, people want to talk about mothers and children, no stigma. But they're all the same in the underlying principles. You can empower village women in such a way that you scale up breastfeeding. Uh, you work with communities, you use data, on, and so on and so forth. So I think that they are extremely relevant. I think they are so universal, I believe they go way beyond uh, HIV in India. And like the song says, if you can do it here, you can do it anywhere. I think you know Frank Sinatra knew what he was uh, singing about. <laughs> I don't know if I know that song. <laughs> <laughs> New York. Ah, oh, that one. <laughs> Okay, um, well thanks, those were great questions. Um, I'd like to recapture a bit the, the microphone and uh, pose you one last question from my side and then perhaps we'll give you an opportunity uh, after that for some uh, uh, broader thinking about your experience. So I, in reading some of what you've been uh, uh, producing recently, I notice you often use words like the importance of compassion, and passion and emotion. And I want to turn to that uh, for a second. Um, our field is one which has really emphasized um, uh, uh, data and evidence and technical analysis. We're here in a university, which is a, a research institution. Uh, but in global health, we're often confronted with things that really do raise emotions. Uh, we see suffering. We see disparities, terrible, unfair disparities between better off and worse off people, unfairness in society as a whole, violence as you referred to. So in thinking about introducing emotion into the public health discussion as a leader, as a leader of a public health program, what can you tell us about um, what you have learned about bringing emotion overtly into the conversation? and? What are some of the positive aspects of being able to do that, but also what are some of the risks and how do you manage the risks of bringing in emotion? Because emotion can have both positive and not so positive right. consequences to a conversation. Maybe I'd like to answer that by just giving you a little bit of an, an incident that happened. Uh, I was on a field trip to the northeastern portion of India which borders Burma. It's a very, very remote, kind of almost like a war zone atmosphere. Uh, and I'd come across this boy who was in advanced state of uh, HIV uh, disease and was going to die. And you know, we couldn't really save him uh, then with our, I hope he's alive now, but we couldn't do anything, had to walk away from that. We had neither a private or a public health solution to that. Now when we came back to Delhi and we were planning Avahan, running it out, someone said, epidemiologically, this epidemic in the Northeast makes no difference to the Indian epidemic because it's so small, it's smaller than a district, and there's no epidemiological transition transfer. So that's a rational answer. There's an 
emotional answer saying it's the right thing to do. When you look into the eyes of that boy and you say he has the same right as any other citizen of India, it's just the right thing to do. And I, I just said to my, my, the people I reported to, we are going to do this. So I think in public health, we're not selling widgets, which is what I did at McKinsey and Company. There's no emotion, it's next quarter's profits. But in public health, there's a room for emotion. In fact, I would say if you want to be a leader, you have to acknowledge that room for emotion. Now, where it can go wrong, I think there are lots of people who are only emotional and there's no rationality, there's no data, there's no backbone. There are people who are only rational and you know, are looking at the data, the, what we allude to. And I think the real leadership is in keeping that balance. And I think you were, used the word compassion. And I, I like what the Dalai Lama's definition, compassion is accepting that that person has the same right to happiness as you have. It really works for you in public health if you do that. I mean, at least I've learned that. Um, well, I'd like us to um, start bringing this session to a conclusion, but as part of that, Ashok, I'd like to give you a chance to share with us some of your broader views and visions and ideas about leadership. You're here as a leadership fellow, and um, what are some of the lessons you'd like our audience to take away about growing and developing as a leader? Well, I wonder where to start because my entire experience um, in public health has been an experience of learning some leadership. I would say leadership secrets I learned from the commercial sex worker. That's what my journey of 10 years, last 10 years has been about. So my first learning is that it's, it's a lot of uh, whatever word you want to use to pretend that you are a leader and that you know something about leadership that you will transfer to other people. A leader is a constant student who's always learning and who's understanding what he's good at and what he's not so good at. I think that's something I've learned. I've learned that leadership is not management. Management is about skills. Leadership is about attributes. You have to have certain attributes. God knows where they came from, maybe in early childhood. But leadership is learning what is really fundamental and intrinsic to your personality that emerges in leadership. And there are some universal things in leadership which you can try to emulate and learn, such as vision. I don't know of a leader who doesn't have vision. But I think leadership is very personal. I also believe, at least in my life, and I think I've seen this if I study people who have some leadership, there's a notion of discontinuity. When you are reached a particular zone of comfort in what you're doing, I think it's time to move on. I think you must always have that restlessness inside you that says, I'm getting a little too good at this job. Too many people are blowing smoke at me, whatever the analogy not is. Not in this institution. Oh, you're blowing. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not here. It's time to move on. So seeking that discontinuity in your, in your life uh, is, is very important. I think, therefore, leadership can be learned. You can actually think of ways to create discontinuity and to search inside yourself as to what is good. Because leadership to me is a personally shaped thing. It's not that, you know there are 55,000 books on leadership in Amazon right now. <laughs> That's a real figure. What do you learn? The more you read, the more confused you are till you do a kind of deep search within yourself. But can I say some more? Please. Uh, yes. <laughs> That's the idea. <laughs> so, you know, I think that I've learned a few things about leadership uh, as a person who's stumbled and fallen and gotten up and learned from people around him. First is that the learning comes from very unlikely places. The last place it comes from are those famous leaders. I can't, with no disrespect to Winston Churchill, I can't study his life or Steve Jobs' life and learn anything very useful that I can apply. I learned a lot from the sex worker. I mean it, honestly. And we often don't look in that direction. So that is an extremely important aspect. To me, if I use passion, I would use compassion along with it. I would use the word being a student. If I talk of vision, I would say, how do you live the vision? Vision is motherhood and apple pie very often. It's something so far away you can't see it. But the vision's got to be in the next room. You have to act today as though the vision is tomorrow. I mean, 
I'm giving a little plug here. I left the foundation partly because I want to create another institution or organization that does delivery at scale. I can tell you how many rooms there are in that house. You really have to work with communities the same way. You have to be able to live, live the vision and so on. You have to say what's right versus what's rational. You have to know what's intuitive versus what's being deliberate. I think there's a bunch of these things. Some of these are very personal. You can say, well, I was never intuitive. I'm more deliberate. But you can say vision and living the vision has to be universal. So I think there are a few of these things. I hope some people take my course and, and give me a chance to <laughs> expound for a little more time. Well, that's on two this. plugs. <laughs> <laughs> so there you yeah. go. There is a course, and you can hear more about this uh, from Ashok for the rest of this uh, this quarter. I think those were great words for us to bring this uh, session uh, uh, to a conclusion on. Uh, we talk here at uh, Harvard School of Public Health uh, quite a lot about how we see ourselves as training the leaders, the future leaders in public health. And I think Ashok has given us some very good guidance about that, that leaders indeed can be trained, leadership can be learned, but leadership means keeping your feet on the ground, listening to those you serve, listening to others, having both compassion and emotion as you bring rationality into the conversation. So please join me in thanking him. Thank you. Take his course. Thank you very much for joining us today.